about somebody that is hopeless? I'm not talking about somebody that is going through a season of, of hopelessness. I'm talking about somebody that's just hopeless all the time. Those people are no fun. They're always complaining about something, okay? It doesn't matter what the topic is. It's like you're, you're, you're walking towards the bathroom and you just say hi to your neighbor, hey, how are you? And they're like, I'm not okay. And you're like, oh, i just casually asking how are you doing? I actually got to go to the bathroom. You know, uh, yeah, good to see you, bye, you know? There, there's always something wrong with helpless people, okay? Always, always, always. And they're no fun to be around. They're always complaining about something. And that's kind of me sometimes. I'm a little bit hopeless, you know? I'm always, I'm always seeing the bad things, you know? Um, doesn't matter what it is. I'm always focusing on the, on the bad things, you know? And I, that's something I got to work on, and I'm, I struggle with it, you know? But a lot of us in this room are not hopeless all the time. A lot of us in this room, we're just, we just go through seasons of hopelessness, you know? And, um, and hopelessness is tough because it's never just like, oh, I'm feeling hopeless today. Hopeless is always connected to something else. It's always uh, a whole package, you know? Hopeless is always attached to pain and suffering and hardship, you know? And so it's, it's a whole package deal, and, it, and, it's, and it's tough. Hopeless is never alone. And sometimes, you know, we, we feel so much pain, you know, and, and so much hopelessness that we, we start to ask ourselves certain questions, you know, can, can God really deal with the situation I'm going through right now? Is it really worth it to trust God through this? Can he fix this? And sometimes we're, 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 we are in that state of hopelessness. We ask ourselves those things and, and we doubt God's ability. So let's, let's go to Luke right now, Luke 24, and let's see um, a time of hopelessness, okay? As you open up Luke 24, I just want to go ahead and, and read another passage for you. You don't have to open up there. I'm just going to read one verse from John uh, regarding the death of Jesus. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. How do you think the disciples were feeling um, after Jesus' death? Do you think they were sad, perhaps? Depressed? Lost? Feeling abandoned? I mean, Judas killed himself. That's how emotionally disturbed he was at the moment. The disciples, perhaps, they, they lost hope after Jesus' death. So let's open up in Luke 24. And let's see how the disciples were feeling. Let's start on verse uh, 15. To give you a context over here, these are two disciples walking on the road of Emmaus. And they're talking about Jesus. And then Jesus shows up, okay, and reveals himself. Not, not, not in the moment, you know, but we're, let's, let's go ahead and read verse 15 and, and see the rest of the story. 15. And while they were disgusting and arguing, Jesus himself came near and began to walk along with them. But they were prevented from recognizing him. Then he asked them, what is the dispute that you are having with each other as you're walking? And here we go. And they stopped walking and looked discouraged. They stopped walking and looked discouraged. Verse 18. You already got a hint here of how they're feeling, okay? Verse 18. The one named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that are happening there these days? I love this question over here because it's, it's, it's absurd. Like, how do you not know this? How do you not know what's been happening in Jerusalem? It's the equivalent of somebody, you know, coming to you today and asking, hey, what is COVID? You're like, where have you been? How do you not know what COVID is? Like, where were you? Everybody knows, the whole world knows about COVID. How do you not know what, about COVID? And so it's, it's the same deal over here. They're just at awe that this visitor, which is Jesus, uh, doesn't know or is asking what, what's, what's going on in Jerusalem, you know? Everybody in Jerusalem knew, everybody. It was the talk of the town. And then verse 19, Jesus goes along and asks the question, what things, I love it, he's just being like, you know, playing with him, you know? What things are you talking about, I, he asked. So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, powerful in action and speech before God and all people, and how 
our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. Verse 21. But we were hoping. But we were hoping that he was going to be the one who was about to redeem Israel. They were without hope in this moment. They put all their, their money, all their coins in Jesus. And in their eyes, Jesus died and that was it. They were hoping that Jesus was gonna be the one to redeem Israel from the Romans. But now Jesus is dead. And so they're wondering like, what now? He's no longer here. We were, we were hoping he was the one. But now he's gone. They lost all hope. They had no direction, no answer, no hope. And some of us in this room right now might be going through a situation where you feel hopeless and you, you don't know, you don't have an answer, you don't have a, a direction, you don't have a hope. But let me tell you this, this is not gonna be the first time or the last time you're gonna feel hopeless. Over and over and over and over again, we're gonna be discouraged, we're gonna feel hopeless. We're gonna go through tough situations, through hardship. It's part of our lives, it's part of, it's part of this broken world that we live in, it's inevitable. And when we feel hopeless, we can only focus on one thing, right? Sometimes we just, we, we get hopeless when we're focused just on one hardship and we can see anything else apart from that. We just focus on the bad things. We get like tunnel vision and we can't see anything else. And this is exactly what was happening to the disciples over here. The disciples weren't walking and talking about, man, remember that time that Jesus fed the 5,000? That was cool. Oh, remember that time he uh, cured the leper? Or that time he healed the blind or made the, the, the cripple walk? No, 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 no. They were focusing on the bad things. They were focusing on the death of Jesus and how they lost all hope. They could only focus on their hardship at the moment. Which this brings me to my first point. Don't waste your hardship. Don't waste your hardship. Was this the end of the story? Jesus died and that was it? The disciples then, you know, had to go to therapy to, you know, to get over their depression and, and then they moved on with their lives as if nothing happened? No, this was not the end of the story. As a matter of fact, as we continue here uh, on verse uh, 32, Jesus actually reveals himself to the disciples. And then they say this on verse 32. Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking with us on the road and opened the scripture to us? Jesus was filling their hearts with hope again. He was revealing himself and showing to them that he had overcome death itself. He was revealing to them that he was still alive and he was bringing hopes to them. And not only that, eventually God fulfills the promise of giving them the Holy Spirit, a counselor, a helper, someone who, was always help, who, someone who would always help them remember the words of Jesus. Somebody will be with them for the rest of their lives. Now let me ask you this. Do you think the disciples wasted this hardship? Do you think they were just like one day, you know, walking on the road and be like, man, that was, that was crazy, right? It was a roller coaster of emotions with Jesus. Do you wanna go out for a coffee? Do you, do you think they're like, this was like a dinner conversation, you know? Yeah, and one day we're walking, you know, and, uh, to the tomb and the tomb is empty. Can you pass me the bread, please? Was it, did it become something casual to them? No, it was not casual at all. Once their hearts were filled up with hope again by the fact that they understood that Jesus overcame death, and overcome the world, their hearts were filled with hope and, they, and they, they lived for Jesus. Everything from that point on was about Jesus. They wrote books about Jesus. They went to different towns and, and preached about Jesus. They were persecuted because of Jesus. They died because of Jesus. They didn't waste their hardship. They did something with it. And because they didn't wait, waste their hardship, we're here today talking about the transforming power of Jesus. 
Sometimes, you know, we, whenever we go through hardships, we just isolate ourselves, right? We're going through something tough, and what do we do? We, we just put that problem very, very in our hearts, very, very deep inside where nobody can find it, and we don't want to talk about it, we don't want to touch it, we don't want to think about it, and we hope nobody ever asks us about it because we don't want to deal with it. We just hide it and hope it never comes back again. That's how we deal with hardship a lot of times. But the reality is this. We need to use our hardships for good. We need to use our sadness and hopelessness for good. We need to redeem our hardship. Last year uh, in November, uh, my wife got pregnant. And um, we were very excited about it. And uh, we went to the, to the doctor to take a look at how everything was going. And uh, I have your ultrasound from our baby. And um, this was the first time and last time we saw him. And uh, he looks like a little duck. And so we called him Ducklin, you know. And uh, we love Ducklin very much. And uh, not too long after that, my wife got pregnant again. And uh, we were able to see the ultrasound, and it was very tiny, very tiny baby, like the size of a, of a bean. And uh, we called him uh, Mr. Bean because he was very tiny, like a bean. And I always say that he is the funniest and also the ugliest of the family, you know, because you know Mr. Bean. Anybody knows Mr. Bean over here? Nobody? Okay, some people know. Okay, we're good. Um, and so anyway, and then eventually my wife got pregnant for the third time. And... Um, the Lord took it from us again for the third time. And we call her Blue River because, you know, in heaven we're going to have blue rivers. And this was all in a period of five months. Three babies in five months. And um, it was very tough for me. It was tough for my wife as well, but my wife handled it much better than I did. You know, she's a very strong woman. But I was, quite frankly, I was very hopeless. You know, my entire life, every time I... I had a problem, you know, uh, and, and I needed a, um, a provision or to be fixed. I knew for a fact that the Lord was going to provide a way. I knew it. You know, he always did. You know, I was in college. I didn't have any money in my bank account. I had zero dollars in my bank account. I knew the Lord was going to provide a way. He gave me a job that week. Um, also, my car broke. Somebody came and fixed my car for free. And so just in my entire life, everything, things would just come my way, and I knew I, there's no way I could deal with it. I gave it up to God, and God always fixed it. He always provided. I always had faith that he was going to. And then this time, my wife was bleeding a little bit more than usual. And the first time, I was like, no, 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 God, the Lord is going to do something about it. The Lord is going to provide. He's going to fix it. And then the Lord decided not to. He had different plans. The second time, same thing. The third time, same thing. And the first time, for me, it was easy to say, the Lord is good. Amen? Amen. The second time was a little bit harder to say the Lord is good. The third time, I would say these words, but my heart didn't want to. My heart wasn't meaning it. And so I had a, a very hard time. I was feeling very hopeless. How, why, God? Why didn't you fix this? Why? I remember going to the doctor and um, hoping we would find a problem, hoping there was something wrong with my wife so that I could do what? I could fix it, so that I can pay for the medicine, so that I can pay for surgery, so that I can fix it. And we turn, it turns out we get there, we do all the exam exams and we do everything, and all the doctors are saying the same thing, beautiful, perfect, everything is great. Try it again. And I, I was confused. And I had to repent of my pride. Because I wanted to be the problem solver. I wanted to be the one to fix it. Because God didn't, and so I wanted to do it. That's pride. Dr. Tony Evans says this, your greatest faith lessons will be in the dark. God exposed my pride during those five months that I wanted to be the one in control. But the reality is this, he's the one in control, not me. And so sometimes we can only learn some lessons through hardship. 
and God taught me some things, and, just, and he's continued to teach me things. But we decided not to waste this hardship, right? We decided to do something about it. We decided to learn and redeem this hardship. We decided to you know, embrace the fact that God can turn bad things into good things for his glory. As a matter of fact, we see that in the Bible all the time. We see a, a messed up character of the Bible, and then God shows up, and then boom, great things happen. So God loves to do that, uh, turn terrible things to show off his glory. Terrible things into good things to show off his glory. And so I just want to share with you real quick three things that my wife and I decided to do to redeem, you know, the situation in our lives. So the first thing we decided to do was to share our story. To share our story to bring hope to others that God is in control, even though it seems like everything is out of control. Even though it seems like we're in the middle of the chaos, God is in control. And so we decided to share the story with others to remind people that God has a perfect plan despite your opinion. God has a perfect plan despite my opinion. The second thing that we decided to do to redeem this hardship was to uh, speed things up when it comes to the adoption process. My wife and I, we were thinking about adoption from the time we were engaged already. Uh, something we always wanted to do. And we're still gonna try to have our babies of our own. Um, but after this, we thought, you know, perhaps the Lord is leading us to to start this process sooner, you know? And so this is a way that we're finding out that we can redeem this process, you know, this hardship. Another thing, and the last thing, you know, I wanna share how we're, we're redeeming this process in our lives is the fact that our babies are in heaven. We haven't lost them. We're gonna see them again. And we're certain of that. We have hope of that, that the Lord is there in heaven right now preparing a table for us and we're gonna dine one day with our three children. We're gonna dine and get to know Ducklin, Blue River, and Bean. We're excited about that. So we're hopeful about that. And so that brings me to my, my last point. Hope is looking to the future. Hope is looking to the future. You don't have to open up there, but I just wanna read here something real quick on John 16, 33. I have told you, these things so that in me you may have peace. You will have suffering in this world. Be courageous. I have conquered the world. So the first part here of the verse, Jesus is saying, I have told you these things so that you may have peace. What are these things that Jesus told them? Jesus was preparing them for his death and resurrection. He was already telling them about how he was going to go for a little bit and but come back. You know, he was already preparing them for what was to come and told them not to lose hope because he's coming back. And then after he says them to to have peace and not to worry, he says this, you have suffering in this world. It's like, what the, Jesus, what what are you saying? You're going to have sufferings in this world? Like you just told me that to have peace and to chill and now you're telling me I'm going to suffer? How does that even work? How does, how does, it seems like a contradictory statement, you know, in a sense. How can I have peace, but I'm going to have troubles? It's not very comforting. And then he finishes off with this. Be courageous. I have overcome the world. Oh, this is great, Jesus. Thank you very much. You're like, you have overcome the world, but I haven't. All right? I have not overcome the world. You are a great teacher, a great prophet, but I am me. How do you expect me to have peace? Tell me I'm going to have troubles. You have overcome the world, but I haven't. How do, how do we do this? When Jesus say, be courageous, because I have overcome the world, he is telling his disciples this, be courageous because I have overcome the world and I'm going to fight with you, alongside you. Be encouraged by that. Have hope and have peace. Yes, you're going to suffer a little bit, but I'm going to be with you, so be courageous. I'm going to be with you the whole time. And so Jesus is trying to encourage the disciples and telling them, don't worry, be courageous. Hardship is going to come, but I'm going to be with you. Your home life might not be too good right now, but I'm going to be with you. I'm going to fight with you. Your battle against sin is going to be tough, but I'm going to be with you. Be courageous. I'm there through your hardship. In other words, Jesus is telling us to be courageous because 
sin, hardship, and our problems do not have the final word. He does. He's saying, hey, be courageous. I have overcome the world. Doesn't matter what the world is going to throw at you. I have overcome the world, and I'm with you. So be courageous. Let me try to uh, explain this a little bit better in an illustration. So right here, I have a, a little rope, okay? And let's pretend that um, this right here is your life, okay? This little red thing over here is your life. And this is when you're born, and this is when you die. And let me tell you, we're all going to reach this. Everybody here in this room is going to die, okay? Everybody. And whenever we're born, we're born with something called uh, sin nature, right? What does that mean? That means that we're all going to sin, not once, not twice. We're going to sin a lot for the rest of our lives. And we're all destined to the same place, death over here. All of us, all of us in this room. And whenever you accept Christ, your eternity becomes not separation with God, but eternity with God. But whenever you don't accept Christ in your life, you're going to spend, this time is going to come, you're going to spend eternity apart from God, hell. And so as we live our lives, we're all going to go through different things. You know, I ask our students, you know, hey, give me some examples of some hardships that you may, that you may have. And um, they gave me some really good ones, very, some very good hardships. Uh, they told me a breakup, that's a hardship. Uh, they also told me uh, allergy to gluten, that's a hardship. Uh, gas prices, uh, didn't go to the college I wanted to. I get mocked at school. Uh, death of a loved one, trauma, I got fired, cancer, divorce. And so this is your life. And then cancer may come. And then you may be mocked at school or you may lose your job and things like that. And so we all have these problems that happen in our lives. And then whenever something like this happens, whenever a problem like this happens, a hardship happens, what do we do? Man, we focus on this little thing. And we, that's, this consumes our minds. Like we can go to sleep sometimes because we can't stop thinking about our own personal hardship. And we just get so focused, tunnel vision, that we can't do or think anything else. We started to, to be mean to our family members because we're upset about something. We start not to perform well in our jobs because we're consumed by a hardship. We get so focused on this little thing. And what do we forget? Eternity. What is this little thing over here in comparison to eternity? Like, if you think about it, look at the size of this little thing in comparison to the great things that are going to come in the future. We get so consumed by this, this becomes our lives, these little problems. Let me put this in the words of, of, of Paul in Romans 18. 8, 18, he says this, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are nothing, are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. The struggles and the hard times are nothing compared to what's going to be revealed at the end. We waste so much time focusing on the little hardships and we forget to look at the future. We forget to look at eternity and how sometimes this hardship is, is it's hard, it's going to hurt, but it's temporary and it's not worth comparing to eternity. It's not. These momentary troubles are not worth comparing. Let me uh, illustrate this a different way. I... Um, a couple of weeks ago, we had um, the Polka Fest over here, you know, at our town. Who went to the Polka Fest? Okay, good, good, a couple of you, right? I did go to the Polka Fest, and I, I ran a 5K in the Polka Fest, okay? And in the morning of, uh, of the run, I was like, you know what? Uh, why don't I run the 5K in a bear suit? 
you know, why not? And I, ha- I have a picture here of, of me in a bear suit running the 5K. And you're probably asking yourself, like, why? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It just came to my head. I'm like, yeah, let's just do it, whatever. You know, let's just do it. And so I ran the 5K. It was hot, okay? That suit is sweaty. I'm so sorry. That's Alicia's suit. Alicia, throw, it, throw that away. I'm so sorry, okay? Uh, anyway, it was, it was not easy, right? It was hot. You know, I was not on shape. I was not ready for a 5K. I was actually going to run the 10K, but I'm glad I, I went to the 5K. Anyway, it was not an easy task, but it was, it was fun, and, you know, at some point, you know. What if I told you today, hey, I want you to go right, right now, go outside, put the bear suit on, and run a 10K? Would you do it? No, why? It's hot outside. You're not in shape. You're not ready, okay? You're going to be dehydrated. You're going to be sweating. You're going to be hot. You might faint. Why would you do that? In a bear suit, terrible idea. What if I told you, hey, I want you to run a, a 10K in the bear suit for $100 billion. Would you say yes? I see your heads. I, yeah, I, 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 like, I would do it. Put me in right now. Where's the bear suit? Give it to me. Why would, you, why would you be okay with that? You're still out of shape. You're still gonna be sweaty. You're still gonna hurt. Your knees tomorrow, you won't be able to get up. Why would you say you're okay? It's the same thing. Why, why would you say you're okay to those sufferings? Because your mind, your hope is at the price. You see the price as much bigger than the suffering. You see the price not even worth comparing to the sufferings. You see the end goal, you're like, man, I don't care I'm gonna be sweaty, that it's gonna hurt, that I won't be able to walk tomorrow, that I might faint, the price is too good. When I'm running, I'm gonna be like, whatever, you know, $100 billion, I gotta gotta have it. And we gotta do the same thing when it comes to our suffering. We gotta think about eternity, Our, our price, our hope is in eternity with heaven, with Jesus forever free from cancer, free from pain, free from sorrow. We need to learn how to suffer, like Paul did. We've got to focus into eternity. You can have hope again because heaven is a promise for us. You can have hope again because heaven is a promise for us. Is it gonna hurt on the way there? Oh yeah. Is it gonna be tough? Oh yeah. But it's not worth comparing to the price that we have ahead of us. And so as I close here, I only have two applications for you. Just two. The first is, do not waste the hardship. If you're going through a, through a hardship, I want you to do, redeem the hardship. I want you to use the hardship for the glory of God. Don't suffer and just, just be on your own, isolate yourself and, and throw that in the, in, the, in the depths of your heart and pretend it's not there. Use that for the glory of God. Redeem that. God will help you find a way. He will help you turn good things into, bad things into good things. Redeem the hardship. And lastly, focus on eternity. That's where our hope is at. Focus on eternity. Your troubles are going to be so much more easier to deal with whenever your eyes are are on eternity. You're going to have a different way about you. You're not going to suffer the same way your coworkers suffer. You're not going to go through hardship the same way your neighbor goes through. You're going to look at life differently. You're going to look at it as part of the process. But in heaven, we're going to be together with Jesus. So it's worth it what I'm going through right now. The Lord is preparing a table for us, a place with no sorrow, no pain, no hardship. He's preparing. He's waiting for us. Let's put a hope in that.